am going to sing a song that some people might know, so sing with me if you want to. Um, but first I'm going to read a verse. In 1 John 5, no, 1 John 4, starting in verse 15, it says, Whoever confesses that Jesus is the Son of God, God abides in him and he in God. So we have come to know and to believe the love that God has for us. God is love, and whoever abides in love abides in God, and God abides in him. Um, we love because he first loved us. Aren't you glad he loves us so? We wouldn't have a chance of making it to heaven without the love of God, would we? No way possible. But because he loves us, every one of us can go there. And that's such a tremendous, tremendous song. And I thank her for doing it so beautifully. She writes most of the work that she does. And I appreciate that. I really do. I told her this morning I wish she'd get them published <laughs> because they're wonderful songs full of rich meaning from the Word of God. I want you to turn with me to John chapter 17 and we're going to look at verses 13 through 21 together. This morning and tonight so I hope you'll come back. We're going to be dealing with the subject of temptation. As I counsel many 
of the young people there at the campgrounds, I found how much our youth are dealing with today. Not only our youth, but young couples, middle-aged, older folk. Satan is attacking the church. He's attacking the nation in which we live. And how we need to be aware of the attack of temptation so that you and I can stand against the enemy. We need to be strong in the Lord in the day in which we live. If there's any hope for America, it's that the church remains steadfast, unmovable, always abounding in the work of the Lord. So let's read beginning at verse 13. John 17, yes, those of you who wish to stand for the reading of the word may stand at this time. John 17, beginning at verse 13. This is the prayer of Christ before he will soon go to be with the Father. He says, and now come I to thee, and these things I speak in the world that they might have my joy fulfilled in themselves, referring to the disciples and those who would believe on Christ through their preaching. I have given them thy word, and the world hath hated them. Notice why. Because they are not of the world, even as I am not of the world. I pray not that thou shouldest take them out of the world, but that thou shouldest keep them from the evil or the evil one. They are not of the world. Jesus says it again. They are not of the world, even as I am not of the world. Sanctify them through thy truth. Thy word is truth. As thou hast sent me into the world, even so have I also sent them into the world. And for their sakes I sanctify myself, that they also might be sanctified through the truth. Neither pray I for these alone, now notice, but for them also which shall believe on me through their word. That includes us today. That they all may be one, as thou, Father, art in me and I in thee, that they also may be one in us, that the world may believe that thou hast sent me. Let's look back again at verse 15. Jesus said, I pray not that thou shouldest take them or take the church, the believers of Christ, out of the world, but that thou shouldest keep them from the evil. Jesus wants his church in this present world but he wants us to be separate from the world in which we live. You may be seated. He wants us as believers to live holy, godly, righteous lives. He wants our lives to be markedly different from those who've never invited Christ into their heart and life. He wants us to be the light of this world, the salt of the earth. He wants us to be redemption centers where people can come and learn of Jesus Christ and thus be saved. For that to happen, you and I, as followers of Christ, must be kept from the evil one. You and I must realize from whence temptation comes so we can abstain from the very appearance of evil and live lives that bespeak Christ to our families and friends and neighbors and to those in the world. Shall we pray this morning? Father, we pray that you'll give us the words we need to say and give us ears to hear the words that we need to hear. That we can be a church that understands that with every temptation, God Almighty makes a way of escape. We don't have to sin. We don't have to yield to temptation. We can live victorious Christian lives through the power of the Holy Spirit. If we're ever guilty of sin or transgression, we can plead the advocacy of Jesus Christ.
But your desire for us is that we not only face temptation, but we face it without even causing an act of sin to be a part of our personal experience. So God, today we pray that your Holy Spirit will come in this place. Make us keenly aware of the cunningness, the craftiness, the deceitfulness of Satan, our enemy. That we can robe ourselves in the righteousness of Christ, arm ourselves through the Word of God and the power of the Holy Spirit. That we may live lives pleasing in your sight. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Life is always under attack of temptation. None of us are exempt from being tempted. The Bible teaches us that Jesus was tempted. And in Matthew 4, you can find a scenario of three ways that Satan approached him. And you find in 1 John that John, the beloved disciple, writes these same three avenues that Satan attempts to tempt us today and to lure us away from our affection for Christ and things godly. So Jesus was tempted and yet without sin. So being tempted is not sinful. Understand that. Temptation came even to our Savior Jesus Christ. So temptation in itself is not sin. It's how we respond in that hour of temptation. If we give in to temptation, we've sinned. We've committed an act of willful transgression. And my friend, the Bible says we must then plead the advocacy of Jesus Christ in 1 John 2, 1, where he writes, My little children... These things I write to you that you sin not. An aorist tense in the Greek. I'm writing you the word that you won't even commit an act of sin. But if you do, if you're ever careless, if you're ever guilty, don't quit because you have an advocate with the Father, Jesus Christ the righteous, who will forgive the believer's sin as well as the sins of the world. So my friend... We must understand that temptation is real. It comes to each of us at different times. Sometimes unexpectedly it just comes out of the night. And we must be ready for the attacks of the enemy. This is why Jesus prayed the prayer recorded in our text. I pray not that thou shouldest take them out of the world. But I pray that thou shouldest keep them from the evil one. Jesus is praying for you and for me every day of our lives that we will stand strong in the Lord, that we will not yield to temptation, that we will let nothing separate us from God or each other. That's the devil's business. He wants to divide brothers and sisters in Christ because Jesus said when we're one, When we're one, the world will believe. But when we're fragmented and the devil can come in and divide us, brother, the witness of the church goes down in terms of its appeal to those that are lost in sin. Because of the attack of temptation, Peter wrote these words in 1 Peter 5, 8, Be sober, be vigilant. Because your adversary, the devil, as a roaring lion walking about, seeking whom he may devour. He's saying that you and I are to be wise of the cunnings and craftiness of the enemy. We're to be watchful. We're to be alerted. Regardless of how long we've been a Christian, we're to be alerted to the fact that the enemy is going to tempt us and seek to deceive us because Jesus said only those who endure unto the end shall be saved. When I was at this camp meeting, I didn't know that Brother Leland had backslidden. He was one of my favorite people when I preached to Southern Illinois camp meetings because he was so blessed of God and praised the Lord and sang like an angel. Little did I know that recently he had been through two years of struggle. He had lost his health. His his voice that he sang and preached with was gone. He can only whisper now. And because of that, 
he had gone back to his former ways. Before he was saved years ago, Leland was an alcoholic. And one night, under great depression and discouragement, he sought relief from the bottle. And you know what that means for an alcoholic? He became entrapped again and un unable to quit what he was doing until the next to the final night of the camp meeting. He ran to the altar, and I've never heard a grown man wail like he wailed, begging God to forgive him, begging God to take this demon of alcohol away from him, begging God to restore him to a place of service in the kingdom of God. And God saved him. <laughs> he restored him. And he got up so happy, little bitty guy, that he picked me up off the floor and began to jump with me. Like <laughs> I said, Leland, put me down. <laughs> he was happy in the Lord because God had forgiven him. And he was doing the first works over again and asking God's forgiveness. None of us are beyond the reach of the enemy. None of us are exempt from the wily works of the enemy. We're no match for Satan apart from Christ and the power of his Holy Spirit. The Bible says there are only two masters and we're serving one or the other. We're either serving Jesus or we're serving the enemy. The enemy's in control of us. So my friends, we've got to be sober. We've got to be vigilant. We're to be wise and watchful lest we be devoured by Satan. Although life is always under attack from temptation, no enemy can make an invasion into our life until he finds a way of access. When then does temptation find a way of access? into a believer's life. Where do our temptations come from anyway? My friends, if we know from whence the attack is likely to come, we will have a better chance to overcome and to, and to defeat it. And that's the purpose of the message this morning. First of all, we find that the attack of temptation sometimes comes from outside of us. And by the way, young people, these are the easiest temptations to deal with. And yet many youth fail in the hour of temptation. But temptations from outside of us are the easiest ones to deal with. You say, what do you mean, Brother Absher? These can be friendships. These can be associations which can ultimately do us harm. We need to realize that there are people in this world whose influence is bad. Now, are we to sit in the church and never go into the world? Of course not. But Jesus is saying our best friends, our friends of support, our friends of encouragement, our friends that will help us grow in Christ are to be fellow believers. Our closest associates the ones we share with, the ones we study the Word with, the ones we pray with, the ones we glean strength from are to be fellow believers in Jesus Christ. Now we make relationship with those who are lost in sin, but always for one motive, and that's to inroad into their life and help them come to know Jesus Christ. We never do the things they do that are sinful. We stand up as a light in the world and as the salt of the earth. And if you run with the devil's crowd, it won't be long till Satan is making inroads into your life. There are also places and things whose influence is bad. I remember early in my ministry, I used to say certain things are bad on television. Now I must say most things. Did you hear me? Most things are bad on television. 
You can't even watch advertising without sexual innuendos. You said, boy, Brother Absher, you're an old fogey. No. I know the ways of the devil. I know the wiles of the enemy. I know how he entraps the minds of young people. And I know how he puts in bondage the souls of men throughout their lives. We have to be careful about what we watch on television. We have to be careful what we go to see at the movie theater. There's so much trash and indecency. We wonder why immorality is running rampant. It's because the church has forgotten the ways that Satan makes inroads into our hearts and lives. There are places of the world we cannot go as Christians. There's adornment of the world that we cannot wear as Christians. My friends, modesty is the clear teaching of the Word of God. And God expects His children to dress modestly. You say, well, we'd stick out from the crowd. So what? So what? If our nation's going to be turned back to God, it's going to be turned back not only by our singing of love, but our living a life that bespeaks our love for Christ and holiness and righteousness and godly living. Pornographic literature at the newsstand or on the internet cannot be viewed by children of God. It's an avenue through which Satan works his wily ways to get his tentacles around our heart and life and squeeze out our love for the things of God. Remember Jesus said in our text that we're in the world but not to be of the world, in the world, but not to be of the world. You know, when I go fishing, I trust my old boat to keep me afloat. But I want to tell you something. If I pull that little rubber thing in the back with a brass handle, if I unscrew that and pull it out, and the lake begins to come into the boat, I've got trouble. Because the boat is going to sink. And by the way, if I'm in the boat, I'm going to sink. <laughs> we can be in the world, and we are to be. I move in the world every day of my life. And I look for opportunities to share and witness to other people. I try to make inroads into people's lives. But always to share the gospel. Always to set the example of Jesus Christ. Because God is not willing that any should perish and neither am I. I don't want anyone to miss heaven and go to hell. And so my life has to be one that's in the world. But not of the world. I don't live in criticism and judgment and gossip of those who are living in world's bondage. But I'll tell you one thing, I attempt every day to keep myself unspotted from this world and to live an example before others. In a tempting world, we should be very careful in our choices of friends and of the society in which we move. We should give temptations from without as little chance as possible because some of these others are tougher. It's one of the tragic facts of life that temptations can come to us from those who love us. And of all kinds of temptations, I've found in my life it's the hardest one to deal with. It comes from people who love us and want only the best for us. Now hear me. They don't have the slightest intention of hurting us. It may be a companion. It may be a friend. It may be even a parent. 
that can be a source of temptation. You say, Brother Abshur, how can that happen? Well, a person may know that he's to take a certain course of action. You see, God's Spirit still convicts us as Christians and tries to get us to go in a certain direction and to do certain things. In fact, the Holy Spirit oft times comes upon us and wants to direct our lives in full-time ministry. I found that the Holy Spirit will convict people to go to church and they know there should, but their companion wants them to stay at home with. Or someone's convicted to go to the altar and, and someone else nudges them and say, well, you can settle that someplace else. Or someone is being by the Holy Spirit convicted to be saved and someone says, well, just wait and pray about it and see if it's really what you need to do. Others are encouraged to be filled by the Holy Spirit and there are those who would raise a question mark over that. What does it mean? Are you sure you want to seek this experience? I found especially... Young people may be drawn to a certain career. Did you know, young people, God is still calling Christians into Christian education? He's still calling Christians into the Christian music field. He's still calling young men and young women to the ministry and to pastoral work. Let me add a a footnote at this point. When Brother Absher's age group retires, when we're no longer able to fill the pulpit and do the bidding of the church, 50% of Church of God preachers will no longer be available. Now think of that. One half of the pastors of the Church of God right now are in the baby boomer generation. And so you know God is trying to call young people into the ministry. He's calling young people into missionary work. He needs young people full of life and vitality, brilliant minds and able students to do mission work. Now hear me, here's where the temptation comes. To follow that course of action may involve unpopularity. It may involve risk from your family's perspective. To accept that career may be to give up all that the world calls a career. Because you certainly won't be paid like you're paid in other venues of life. So oft times those who love that person seek to dissuade them And because they love that person, they counsel caution and prudence and worldly wisdom. They say, listen, you can serve Jesus in other ways. Did you know Jesus' family came and tried to take him home because they said he was mad in Mark 3, 21? To them, Jesus seemed to be making a fool of himself and they tried to stop him. Oh, they loved him. But they didn't want him risking his life. Sometimes the bitterest of all temptations come to us from the voice of love. People who love us want the best for us. But they don't know the mind of God for that person's life. There's another odd way in which temptation comes, especially to young people. There's something within us that makes us want to appear as macho men and experienced women. (laughs) We don't want the kids at school or anyone else to think we're any less of a man than they are. You see, we're born with an Adamic nature. We're born with an Adamic nature and we can't stand to be different from others. 
And so many times Satan uses this innate feeling in our hearts to lead us to compromise. Many a person has begun on some indulgence or introduced himself to some habit because he did not wish to appear less experienced in worldliness than the company in which he happened to be. Perhaps they cracked open a package of cigarettes and offered you one. Perhaps they broke open a carton of beer and handed you a can. Perhaps they were experimenting with marijuana or drugs and you were in the group. What do you do? Perhaps they were talking about sex outside of marriage. Premarital sex. Experimental sex. What do you do? Young people, I pray with all that's within me, that you will be different in today's world. That you will realize your body is the temple of God. Don't use tobacco. Anyone that uses it will tell you they wish they couldn't, could be freed from it. It's a hard thing. Don't use alcohol of any kind. Abstain from the very appearance of evil just took one drink for that preacher to backslide. Got a hold of him again. Don't experiment with drugs. It'll ruin your life. Don't experiment with sex. Be a virgin when you marry the one that God leads you to and stay faithful to that one till death you do part. May God help the church to be mindful of the wiles of the devil and to live a different life. May I hasten to say that temptation comes not only from the outside of us, but it comes from inside of us. If there were nothing in us to which temptation could appeal, temptation would be helpless in its power to defeat us. However, in every one of us, there's a weak spot. If we're not on the watch, that weak spot can ruin us in the hour of temptation. Paul tells us in Galatians 5.17 that the flesh lusteth against the spirit and the spirit against the flesh so that you cannot do the things that you would, that which would come natural to you, that which you desire to do. Read the works of the flesh in Galatians 5. It may be some fault of temperament. In my ministry, I've known people who at times were the most likable people you'd ever want to be around. And at other times, they were the most moody people. Likable, moody. Couldn't please them if you wanted to. I've known people that at times were the most loving and other times the most hateful. I've known people who seem to understand situations and other times the same people resented anything that didn't go their way. I've known people who preferred their brother and sister and at other times envy would rise up and they were envious over others in the body of Christ. It may also be some instinct or passion that is our weakness. An unnatural love for the opposite sex. Money. And what money can buy. Prestige. Pleasure. Just an unusual appetite for pleasure. There may be some quirk in our makeup that makes what is a pleasure for someone else a menace to us. We must realize this and be on guard because Satan knows full well where your weak spot is and he'll attack you there. 
And then strangely enough, temptation comes sometimes not from our weakest point, but our strongest point. Have you ever said, that's one thing, brother, I'd never do. I'll tell you that. <laughs> How could they do such a thing? I'd never be guilty of that. It's just there that we should be on the watch. Because Peter tells us in 1 Peter 5, 5, God resisteth the proud, but giveth grace to the humble. History is full of stories of strongholds which were taken just at the point where the defenders thought them so strong they needed no guard. Paul tells us the great apostle he was. I take heed lest after teaching others, I myself should be a castaway. Paul knew as long as he was in this flesh, there was a battle going on. He knew that. And so daily, the scripture says, he brought every thought into subjection to Jesus Christ. He says in Scripture, I die daily. I take up my cross, deny myself, and follow Him. It was a daily ritual with the Apostle Paul because he knew the power of the enemy. We've forgotten that today. Nothing gives temptation its chance like overconfidence. No wonder God says that we must humble ourselves to walk with Him. We're in no position to judge other people. We're in no position to enjoy self-righteousness. We walk humbly with God, declaring the truth of God in love. So at our weakest and our strongest points, we must be on guard. My friends, as I close this morning, how are we dealing with our temptations? The attack of temptation is real, and it's certainly real in this 21st century. Did you know there's only one knob to the door of your heart, and that knob's on the inside? Only one knob to the door of your heart. And that knob is on the inside. The door can't open unless you open it. You've got free will. And the door can't open unless you open it. What we become is no one's fault but our own. It's not society, it's not the ghetto. It's not the environment we were raised in. It's the choices we make when temptation comes to knock at our door. Young people realize this. God is more powerful than Satan. Amen? And if we're willing to look to God in our hour of temptation, He will give us the strength to overcome every temptation that Satan <coughs> throws in our way. Paul said it this way in 1 Corinthians 10, 13. There hath no temptation taken you, but such is common to man. But God is faithful who will not suffer you to be tempted above that you're able, but will with the temptation make a way of escape that you may be able to bear it. Can we live victorious Christian lives? Of course we can. Do we have to sin more or less every... Of course we don't. And the most important thing for you to remember <coughs> as we close this morning, if you failed at any point in the hour of temptation... You have an advocate. Don't give up. But don't live in your sin. If you live in your sin, you'll miss heaven.
But if you come to Jesus and ask His forgiveness, He's your advocate. And He'll forgive you and He'll help you up and brush you off and get you going in a proper direction again. Aren't you thankful for a Savior like that? Amen? He'll help you endure to the very end. You say, but Brother Abitur, that's tough. That's hard. Jesus said it would be. It's false theology that teaches you differently. Straight is the gate, difficult of entrance, narrow is the way, has restrictions that leadeth to life. And no man can come to God without Jesus. No man. In fact, Jesus said, few there be that find it. You say, Brother Abitur, that's so pessimistic. Is it? Is it? Look at the condition of our nation. Look at the condition of our world. Jesus raised the question in his gospels, will I find faith on the earth when I return? Living faith, vibrant faith, faith walking in obedience to God. May God help us to search our hearts this side of eternity and be prepared to meet God. We can be. He's covered every base for us if we want to be. Let's stand together as we look to the Lord in prayer and then are led in a time of invitation. If you want to come to the altar this morning and no one coming to you, you go to the altar on my left, your right. If you want someone to meet with you and counsel you, come to the altar here on my right, your left, and I'll be glad to meet with you. The most important thing is that you respond to the God who loves you and deal with all known sin in your life. That's the purpose. That's the purpose of this message. And tonight we're going to be talking about the ways we can defend against these various avenues that Satan approaches us, and I hope you'll come. Father, we pray this morning that you will help us all to realize what a battle we're engaged in. Temptation is real and it has so many faces in this 21st century. The Bible says he will come as an angel of light. The Bible says he will come as a roaring lion. And there are many shades in between that he comes. He knows his fate is sealed and he wants to take as many as he can with him and master their lives, destroy their potential. So help us, God, this morning to listen to a God who loves us, who has given us his word, that we might understand the attacks of the enemy and stand against him. Till we hear you say, Well done, thou good and faithful servant. Enter into the joys of the Lord. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen.